I'd like to dedicate my talk today to those lives lost and those lives changed forever by the brutal and tragic murders last weekend, a week ago today in Pittsburgh. I spend a lot of time thinking about, writing about, and talking about a very dark and disturbing element of the contemporary landscape. I study far-right extremism. I often feel alone in this endeavor, uh, as there are, it's, a, it's a movement that really hasn't taken on much attention from policymakers, from the media, or even from other academics. Indeed, if we look at subsequent policy reports on the terrorist threat to Canada from Public Safety uh, Canada, they're generally silent on the question of far-right extremism in the country. They're much more concerned with Islamist extremism. Where they do mention the far right, individuals or groups, it's generally to dismiss them as not ideologically coherent and therefore not a threat. I'm here to tell you that's a dangerous mistake to discount the risks associated with the far right, a movement characterized by xenophobic nationalism, by racism, by misogyny, homophobia, and especially now anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. In a report we published in 2015, we identified over 120 incidents of violence associated with the far right between 1980 and 2014. These ranged from assaults to arsons all the way up to homicides. To put that in context, during the same period of time, we identified seven incidents of Islamist-inspired extremism. In spite of that, it's still not a priority for law enforcement and intelligence communities. You can see from this map, sorry, go back. Yeah, I'm seeing it down here. There is a map, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, uh, that shows the distribution of the far right across the, across the country. Uh, at the time, in 2015, when we published, we identified just over a, a hundred uh, active groups. And this is a really conservative uh, estimate, we think, because we're really focusing on urban areas. So you see here there's a significant concentration in Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia. In the last two and a half years, coinc coincidental with uh, Trump's ascendancy, there's been a dramatic growth in the number of groups, in their visibility, and in their online and offline activism. Now, this includes entirely new groups, but also uh, new chapters of existing groups uh, that we had, we had noted at that time. I want to introduce you to some of the characters who keep me awake at night. I struggled a little bit with whether to include photographs and images associated with these groups. I decided in the end I didn't want to give them that kind of public visibility. So what I'm going to share with you are some of their own words. Initially, the Proud Boys emerged first in Canada. You'll remember perhaps last year on Canada Day when they disrupted an indigenous anti-colonialism demonstration. Now the Proud Boys were initially quite light in tone, and honestly, I took it, it was a little difficult for me to take them very seriously. But in subsequent years, they've really hardened their stance and become a little more aggressive in their stance. This is an all-male group. And they profess that the best way to reclaim Western superiority is to return to traditional values, especially in light of their belief that it is feminism that has uh, threatened the ability of men to be men and therefore defend our country. Now, there are multiple steps uh, to initiation into the group. And the first of these is to swear the oath that we see here. I'm a Western chauvinist who refuses to apologize for creating the modern world. Interesting stage of the initiation is number four, where they are required to beat up a member of the anti-fascist movement. Pegida, the acronym 
is from the original German group, Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamization of the West, it is a single issue hate group. And they focus primarily on Muslims. This is one of those groups that didn't have much of a presence in Canada prior to Trump's election. But now we see they have a Pegida Canada chapter, at least four provincial chapters, and several city chapters as well. Now, as I said, they're very much concerned with Islam and the threats that they see them representing. And so they stoke fears of terrorist attacks, of the dissolution of Western values, and, as we see here, of Sharia law. Pegida is very active in the rallies that we've seen peppering the country in the past uh, couple of years. And they're often in attendance with the Soldiers of Odin. Soldiers of Odin, interesting group. Combining good community works with their anti-Muslim street patrols, the Soldiers of Odin are making appearances in cities large and small across the country. They try to cloak their surveillance of mosques and Muslim community centers under the guise of enhancing community safety, which evokes that stereotype of Muslims as dangerous. They're also very much involved in border patrols, where they're guarding the entry points of irregular migrants. So that, too, characterizes immigrants as economic, as cultural, and as security threats. Like Pegida, Lamut, or the Wolf Pack, focuses its energies largely on Islam, although it often extends its animosity to non-white immigrants generally. Established in 2015, they soon claimed 40,000 members online. Now, no doubt this is an exaggeration, but they're still generally understood to be the largest such group in Quebec, if not the country. <laughs> Founded by two military men, uh, Lamut has adopted a similarly regimented hierarchy intended to keep its members in check and on spec in terms of ide ideological positioning. Now, Lamut is present at the anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim rallies across the country but they often are engaged in a much more online activity, and especially in closed and secret forums. The most worrying group for me on the Canadian landscape are the three percenters. The three percenters attract former, and we're beginning to find now, active military and law enforcement personnel. They're heavily armed, and they're engaged in paramilitary training. All of this is in the interest of defending Canadian traditional heritage from enemies, foreign and domestic. Currently, that means that they too take aim at what they see as an inevitable Muslim invasion. So they're often involved in monitoring mosques, looking for signs of terrorist activity. They also frequently act as security for the rallies attended by other far-right groups. Now, this combination of hatred on the one hand with arms and paramilitary training on the other is a disturbing and, I think, potentially deadly one. I'm also concerned by the tendency, increasing tendency, of these groups to form co coalitions. Previously, it was very different. There was, there's been dramatic conflict, both within and between groups. So that's a disturbing trend. So what are we to do? I'm often asked, how can we challenge? How can we confront? How can we counter this resurgence of the right? There are myriad interventions we could invoke, no doubt. I'm particularly uh, taken by those that cross sectors to include not just law enforcement, because it's not just a law enforcement issue, but also include educators, policymakers, the media, and civil society organizations. I really want to highlight three areas of intervention, though. Education, public accountability, and resistance. There's generally fairly limited public awareness of the activities and the threats posed by the far right. 
The media have tried to draw some attention to the groups in recent years, but even they have relatively limited information available. So there are a number of groups and organizations that have set themselves the task of monitoring and studying these groups with an eye to rendering them more transparent. So Anti-Racist Canada has for a long time been the primary source of information. New to the scene is the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, which is similarly committed to shining some light on those lurking in the shadows. Our own Center on Hate, Bias and Extremism at UOIT is aiming to develop empirical evidence of the harms associated with these groups and to use that knowledge to enhance public awareness and public policy and programming. We need to require our public officials to defend what I see as core Canadian values of equity, inclusion, and respect for those that diversity that characterizes our nation. Too often they fail to recognize or to name right-wing extremism as a threat to those values or a threat to our security. In fact, there are some that would seem to condone the movement, as you see in this photograph here of Ontario Premier Doug Ford posing with far-right nationalist Faith Goldie. It was only after three days of intense pressure from politicians and the public alike that he finally denounced Goldie. In contrast, there have been a number of politicians that have taken a very firm and unequivocal stand against hatred. For example, MP Ikra Khalid, who introduced Motion 103, condemning Islamophobia and all forms of systemic discrimination. In the face of rallies in their cities, local mayors have said, oh no you don't, not in my town, and have stood in solidarity with the anti-racists. It's these sorts of reactions that we should expect and I think demand from our public leaders. Finally, we need to continue to resist. Typically, the anti-racists far outnumber the racists at their own rallies. Where the racists might number in the 20s or maybe 50 or 100, the anti-racists are typically in the hundreds, if not thousands. This is an important gesture. It sends an important message to both the far right and to the communities that are targeted, that there are more of us that stand with our Jewish, our Muslim, our LGBTQ brothers and sisters than stand against them. I ask you to be a part of that resistance, to challenge hatred wherever you see it. Please go in peace. Thank you. <laughs>